So by my clock, it is exactly six o'clock. So we're gonna go ahead and get started and our friends can join us as they um, enter the call. Just uh, by way of getting started tonight, first I wanna thank each and every one of you who have signed on for this first ever virtual town hall meeting. We'll learn a lot both about the process and about reopening Pasco schools for the 2021 school year. And we're just really grateful that you as community participants have chosen to be here. I'd also like to introduce a few of my fellow panelists. Um, so when I say your name, if you could give a wave, we have a school board member, Sherry Lankin. She is our vice president, and we're grateful that she's here to partner with us in our governance team in listening to you as a community about how we might best meet your needs as we look at reopening the school in the fall. We also have assistant superintendent, Susan Sparks, Mrs. Sparks. She's here tonight. She is currently um, transitioned into the role of assistant superintendent with responsibilities of supervision of elementary school and then all things instructional in our organization. So uh, Mrs. Sparks is not a new face to us. Um, she's been a solid foundation to the leadership of Pasco School District. She's in a new role, however, for the 2021 school year and we couldn't be more thrilled to partner with her in her new role as assistant superintendent. We also have assistant superintendent Susana Reyes um, who she offers support to our organization in all things operational. So buses, lunches, facilities, community use, uh, facilities use, um, those are all of the pieces of our organization that she thoughtfully provides leadership to and I'm thrilled to um, work alongside this phenomenal team as we do our very best for the kids and community of Pasco School District. So our goal tonight is to share some information with you um, and then allow you to share some information with us. So first and foremost, we this is a public health crisis and it has really inspired and challenged us as leaders to lead from a place of compassion, communication, collaboration, and common sense. We are now focused on reopening our schools with a very thoughtful balance of returning to in-person education, which we all yearn for and love so much, balancing that with safety considerations and building in flexibility to meet the needs of those we serve. So we as a Pasco School District leadership team know and understand that our core purpose is to meet the needs of those we're in service to, including our employees, our students and families in the broader community of Pasco School District and we're honored to do that work. The purpose of tonight, like I mentioned, is to share some information with you. I'm gonna to talk to you about state requirements for reopening. I'm gonna give you a brief summary of some needs that have already been identified through some collaborator meetings. I'll give you a brief summary of survey results from a survey that we pushed out to our families. And then the most important part of tonight is to gather input and considerations from you to guide our planning efforts and help us build a stronger plan for reopening our schools in the fall. There are some things we're not gonna to tackle together tonight. First of all, we're not going to spend time debating or depending, defending the state requirements. So the governor has the authority to um, make proclamation or governor's orders. The Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction and Washington Department of Health all provide us as school district leaders mandates and we are mandated by state requirement to comply with those. We are also not going to be communicating a reopening plan tonight. This is about planning. We are, we are wanting to involve your voice now because we are planning and will continue to plan our reopening through the month of July with the goal of presenting a draft of our reopening plan to our school board on July 28th at the regularly scheduled school board meeting. So we are engaging you as the community early in our planning process um, we have started some planning, but now is the time that we need to hear from you so that we can continue forward and build a strong plan on your behalf. We do have some key requirements that we are, um, that we are, uh, it's a, their mandates, uh, the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction or OSPI provides rules or mandates that we have to follow. One includes the reopening plan that I just referenced. We have to have a reopening plan on file with the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction two weeks prior to school starting, which means we need to have our first draft in front of the board on July 28th. It'll come back to the board on our meeting in um, August 11th uh, for their approval, and then we'll go on file with Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction and the State Board of Education. We 
in the 2020-21 school year have to comply with the instructional hours and days requirement from OSPI. So OSPI says we have to provide 180 days of instruction and an average of 1,027 hours. That requirement was waived last year. There is no waiver currently in place for the 2020-2021 school year. So in our planning, we must plan to meet that 180 day and 1,027 hour requirement. We are also going to be required in 2020, 2021 to take attendance and to follow our regular process for um, communicating enrollment to OSPI. That was also waived or changed or modified for us this spring based on the unique conditions that the COVID virus and that outbreak caused. OSPI did not require its regular ten attendance requirement or its regular enrollment reporting requirement. We will go back to that normal attendance and enrollment requirement for the 2020-2021 school year. This in the spring, our federal and state mandated standardized testing was canceled. OSPI has directed us to plan on a calendar that includes those mandatory assessments. They will work with the federal, um, the federal um, state or education department at the federal level to request a waiver should the federal um, education department um, offer one. At this point, we are not sure if they'll be offering one or not. So we need to plan to deliver those state mandated, state and federally mandated assessments in the spring. We also will go back to having local control over grading. You may remember that in the spring, OSPI created some emergency rules around grading that eliminated certain options for us in grading practices and required others. Um, for example, we were required under the law to give only passing grades and F was eliminated from our options by the OSPI's emergency rules. Those emergency rules will expire and will not be renewed. So local control will go back to having local control of our grading practices. So those are the key requirements from the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction as we know them today. Um, what I know about guidance and compliance um, requirements during this COVID situation is that landscape shifts quickly and it can shift significantly. So what I'm telling you tonight is what I know as of tonight. Um, and can certainly change, but these are the requirements that we're planning against for the fall. Probably the, the broader consideration is really around how the Department of Health or the Washington Department of Health and LNI or the Labor and Industry Guidelines affect our ability to open for in-person or face-to-face -face instruction for 2020-2021. So OSPI guidance states for the 2020-2021 school year, school districts should plan to operate in face-to-face -face and in-person instruction while following the Department of Health and Labor and Industry guidelines. So you can see on this slide here, there are really five buckets of guidance that have been provided to us um, on a foundation of requirements from Department of Health. So the, the foundation is those good solid hygiene practices. So we, in this, we were doing this even in the spring, we were teaching students about washing their hands, that we wash our hands for 20 seconds, um, that we were teaching them about um, if you're gonna sneeze, sneeze into a Kleenex or a tissue and then throw it away and wash your hands. Don't touch your face, don't touch your eyes. Um, those good solid hygiene practices, we had taught those to our students this spring. Um, we provided additional soap, paper towels and hand sanitizer in all of our schools and certainly hand sanitizer was available when soap and water wasn't available. That good old fashioned soap up your hands, rub them for 20 seconds, wash them under some warm water. That is a good old fashioned way to clean your hands. If you couldn't have that, then some hand sanitizer would do the job. And then when you could get to soap and water, wash your hands. So those things we had already started um, putting in place and, and teaching our students about as well as cleaning and disinfecting protocols. We increased cleaning and disinfecting, especially of those high touch surfaces and put some really robust protocols in place for that in the spring. Those would continue in the fall. So that hygiene practice and cleaning and, and disinfecting becomes the foundation by which the rest of the guidelines from the Department of Health and LNI rest on. 
So the first requirement from Department of Health is a daily health screening. So the requirement is that every day a health screening has to happen. We have some flexibility locally what that looks like. Some of you have maybe have seen on social media where you would see students lined up outside their school and they were getting health screenings on site. That's one option. We can also have parents take um, do that at home through a, like an attestation or just letting us know daily that their students don't have a fever, don't have a cough, et cetera. So we have some flexibility with the how of the health screening, but we have to comply with the health screening requirement. We have to also comply with face coverings, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. We also have to comply with six foot social distancing. So this would really apply when students are sitting in class. We have to have a physical layout plan that allows students to be seated six feet apart in their classroom. We also have to build in considerations where we may stagger hallway access or stagger pickup and drop off times to reduce the amount of people who are close to one another, but there is some recognition from the Department of Health that there will be some um, incidental passing one another or when the students are seated six feet apart in the classroom, a teacher may walk by the desk and be inside that six feet for short periods of time, though that is all allowed but the seating of the students in the classroom has to be six feet apart. We also have to be mindful of how we group students and the extent that we can, especially at the elementary, that we keep groups of students together with an adult. Um, this comes less likely at the middle school and high school and there is an allowance in the Department of Health guidance that recognizes that as a regular course of the academic programming, middle school and high school students move around from teacher to teacher and that is allowable under the guidelines. The Department of Health also asks us to think about large groups, for example, assemblies, perhaps we cancel assemblies, um, we have to think about lunch differently, and then also um, modifying what they consider quote unquote high risk activities. So things like choir are, is considered high risk because it requires that students remove a mask and that they're uh, projecting um, so they, th they ask us to think about those, those activities difference. Can they be done outside? Can they be done a different way? So that's one example of a high risk activity. So again, those are the large buckets of guidance that we um, have been given by the Department of Health. So, um, and that, that we have to plan opening in the fall up against, which again are on that foundation of good hygiene practices and making sure that we have a robust cleaning and disinfecting protocol in place. So I said I would talk about face coverings. Face coverings um, is a very difficult issue. We have had lots of phone calls, lots of emails. We've pushed out a survey and face coverings, um, I get an email that says everyone should wear a face covering. I get emails that say no one should have to wear a face covering and everywhere in between. The Department of Health guidance very clearly says that face coverings are a requirement. So as a school district, we don't have the flexibility or the latitude to say no to face coverings. What we could do is advocate for as much flexibility as possible, and it's one of the things that superintendents across the state did. Initially, the Department of Health guidelines limited adults to wearing a mask only. That was the only option for adults in our system. Most recently, um, the, the, this, uh, the plastic face shield that is shown there in the large picture, in this picture right here, was, is now allowed for teachers um, while instructing. So adults in the system can wear the plastic face shield because there's a recognition that students seeing the adults in a school district's face is important to the education and the instructional delivery, but also the social and emotional well-being of our students being able to see and connect with their teacher in those facial gestures um, is just so important. And so if you can envision the difference between students walking into our schools with everyone, with every adult having their face covered versus being able to see the adult's face, the experience would be vastly different for, for our students. So we're very pleased that there is now flexibility for the adults in our system to wear the plastic face shield. That was a requirement or a, an allowable uh, face covering really out of the gate for students. So students can wear a plastic face shield um, like my friend here on the screen, or they can also wear um, the cloth masks, they can be bought, they can be um, sewn at home, or they can utilize the paper masks that we're familiar with as well. So again, I know that the face covering requirement is difficult. I know there's strong feelings around it. Um, as a school district, 
our role is to take a look at the compliance requirements and make them work the very best we can for our students and families. So again, I am pleased that there is some recognition that students seeing the adult faces in our building is important and there's allowable now for our adults to wear the plastic face shields. So based on all of the requirements, the social, the Department of Health requirements, um, we certainly recognize our hearts are having our students back in a traditional face-to-face -face instructional program. That's what we believe in. That's what's in our heart. We also recognize that this environment with the compliance requirements is make, making that challenging. So there are a number of reopening approaches as a school district that we're considering and that we're planning for. And I, and I want you to think about these four approaches less as silos and more as a continuum. So it starts on, the, on my right-hand side with at-home learning and it says at-home learning 2.0. We've heard very clearly from you as a community and families. We did a survey um, back in April or May about how at-home learning was going for you. We also heard comments in our most recent parent survey about how at-home learning was going for you. And we, have, we got lots of very helpful and thoughtful suggestions with parents. There was feedback about where we hit it out of the park and there were feedback where we missed the mark and everything in between and all of that insight and feedback is important to us and will be applied to create an improved version of the at-home learning experience that happened for families in the spring and not improved from a place of criticism about what was in the spring but improvement from the stance that we understand as a school district it's our responsibility to use information to get better and better and so we will apply that information to our at-home learning experience and create a more robust um, and a, a more streamlined process for our families and teachers in the fall. The center options are really in recognition that with the six foot social distancing requirement, it makes it very difficult to have all of our students back at once. It might not be impossible in the long term, but in the short term, it makes it very challenging. So initially, we may need to plan for our on-site face-to-face delivery to be on a rotation schedule where some of our kids come on one day and um, then on another, another group of kids come on a, a separate day. And while they're not with us, they're engaging in at-home learning. Um, we have not made any decisions or determinations about if we did the rotational schedule, how that rotation would work. We really want to hear input and suggestions from you as families about should we need to do this at home rotation? What would you need from us in order to make that kind of an approach um, work the very best it can, knowing that that is not an ideal situation for families? And then on the very, very far my left, is face-to-face -face service delivery, which again, all of us, my teacher heart wants us back face-to-face -face with no masks. I wanna hug every single one of you and every single one of our kids. Um, but right now we are in the middle of a public health crisis and need to recognize it as that. So even when we come back face-to-face, -face, there it is likely that we will still need to maintain some of the department health guidelines around potentially face coverings, potentially social distancing, until there's enough immunity in our community or there's a vaccine um, or our public health leaders tell us that those social distancing and Department of Health requirements are no longer needed. So these are the approaches. And again, like I said, thinking about it more like a continuum and less like silos, we're not choosing just one of these to do or focus on. We're really gonna, going to need as a system to be able to to flex and move between these um, approaches dependent on what the department health guidance allow us to do and also dependent on what our community's health conditions are. So I referenced that I would be sharing with you some information from our collaborator meeting. So we were waiting for the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction and Department of Health to come out with some guidance to help um, build our planning process from. So in, we didn't wait for OSPI, however, we started with some collaborator meetings. So over the course of five collaborator meetings, we en engaged 250 staff, parents, and community members, 
And the goal of those days was to look at those four scenarios I just described to you. And the question we asked was, what would our students need? What would our families need from us? And what would our staff need from us if we were in at home learning 2.0 or in one of our rotation approaches or in our tradi the traditional face-to-face -face learning? Consistently, our, our, the 250 collaborator, there were many, many needs surfaced. I am just um, highlighting for you here the top three. So for our students, it was very important to our collaborators that we had very clear and consistent guidelines and expectations, that we had policies and procedures in place to ensure health and safety. If we were back in person at all, that needed to be clear and communicated and taught to our students, and that we needed to have social emotional supports. There was a recognition that what has happened from the time that we said goodbye to our students in March until now has uh, surfaced some social emotional needs from our students that has a, a trauma for some. Um, it certainly is uncertainty for all of us. It's unexpected for all of us. And there's an awareness that we have to acknowledge that with students as we bring them back to build community and move forward. There was, um, for our families, there was a recognition that we're, if we're in an at-home learning environment, that our families need training on a primary platform. We need to choose a platform. We need to make that clear and transparent for families and provide some proactive support so our families know what to expect. Our families need access to devices and they need access to internet that's reliable um, and affordable for our families and that um, there is a need for support for child care and child care supervision, especially if we're in some kind of a rotation where students are not in school every day, or if um, we're in a rotation ensuring that families with older students that are all in the same rotation so the older students can be home on the same days as younger students for child supervision. For staff, that same clear and consistent guideline and expectation surfaced as a huge need as well as the selection and training on a primary platform. That has come up across the board, whether it was in surveys or collaborator meetings, that having so many platforms and so many options has been a, a huge lift for staff and for families and for students. So narrowing that, getting clear, and getting training on a primary platform to make at-home learning as accessible for everyone and as easy as a lift as possible. Um, is really important. And then staff needed um, access to online educational resources. There are schools who are using certain resources like Dreambox or Imagine Learning or Khan Academy. Those things were robust platforms and, and programs that our, our staff really appreciated and wanted as a district us to continue to focus on. We also just recently sent out a survey. Um, in the first hour that it was open, we got 1,200 responses. The last time I looked, there were nearly 3,000 responses. Um, it was offered in our, our community in English, Spanish, and Russian. It asked families to rank order the most important safety precautions that were, are required of us from the guidance. And you can see them there on the slide. Number one for our families was sanitizing classrooms and surfaces. So we're certainly prepared and ready to do that. Then um, frequent hand washing opportunities, students not sharing materials, keeping that social distancing and providing hand sanitizer. We're in the top five for our families. One of the, the required compliance from the Department of Health is face coverings. That was in the bottom priorities for our families. And so I think that's important to recognize. 90% of our families said they're ready to come back to school. They're like, I'm either ready now, I'll be ready, or if you can um, let me know what the minimum health requirements are that you're gonna put in place, I'll be ready. Um, that changed a little. So about 10% of our families in that scenario were like, oh, I'm not sure if I'm ready to come back. That changed a little bit when we added in the mask requirement. When we said, if masks are required for your students to come back, how comfortable are you going to feel about sending your students back? And about 20% of our families said, if face coverings are required, that I'm not comfortable sending my student back to school. So for those families that um, are feeling uncomfortable about sending their students back and they're not interested in participating in one of our reopening approaches. We are building in flexibility for families. We have an existing IPAL program that serves grades K-12. Um, the K-2 part of our IPAL has some curriculum kits to support families in delivering instruction to their students. The grades three through 12 IPAL 
is an online educational environment that offers core classes. There are some limited electives in grades six through 12 and no electives for grades K through five in our current IPAL program. The IPAL program, um, every student has an individual plan that moves them through the curriculum expectations or the, the class core requirements. And there's weekly check-ins with a certified teacher. They monitor for progress and then also um, ensure that students or that students are taking tests and moving through and progressing through their curriculum. And it um, requires that parents support that process. So we had launched a survey that asked parents, these are the things we already do in IPAL, how do we make IPAL even better for you? So there's a survey out right now about that. So if you're a family that would like to take advantage of that flexibility and would like to provide some feedback, that, um, that survey is posted on our website. We are looking at a new K-5 virtual elementary with, and we plan on opening that in the fall based on interest. So if we have enough families interested in this new K-5 virtual learning environment, um, we are more than ready and happy to open that in the fall. The K-5 virtual learning elementary would consist of four core classes, math, science, ELA, and social studies, and it is an online education environment. Um, it does also offer some electives and part of what we're exploring in partnership with families is how do we create some robust elective opportunities and engagement in partnership with our families. So again, if you're interested in that at all, there is a survey out there. The survey is not obligating you to participate in either one of these things. It's just offering you the opportunity to help us frame the planning moving forward. So that's the information I have to share with you tonight. Um, we are going to open up the rest of the meeting for some dialogue, um, either questions or comments and insights from you. We do have a, a few norms for you to consider tonight. If you have an issue with a specific school or staff member, please refrain from using this public forum to air those individual grievances. We absolutely wanna help you solve issues with specific schools or specific staff. So if you could email Jenny Richardson at psd1.org, she'll get you connected with me and we will get you connected with the right people to solve those individual staff issues. Tonight is not the place for that, however. If you need support in addressing a very specific or unique situation, please follow us up, up with us individually. Again, those are very important to us. There are some very unique needs um, of, our, of our students and families, and we're happy to help navigate those. We want to create flexibility and build in options for families and make sure you have what you need. Again, um, Jenny Richardson, if you can email her, uh, she'll get you connected with me. We'll work together and get you connected right with the right people, and we'll bring that to closure for you. I would ask that you monitor your own airtime to maximize the number of people who have the opportunity to participate publicly. So I think last I looked, we have 112, 124 people on the call tonight. Um, so we want to allow those that want to ask their, their question verbally the opportunity to do that. Um, if you are not a person who's comfortable asking the question verbally with 124 people on the call, um, you can use the chat for that purpose too. Um, if we don't answer your question, publicly on the call, we will be using those questions as a vehicle to build some frequently asked questions um, as, a, as a result of our, our community forums. So the process for tonight, we have my friend Shane Edinger is behind the scenes and he is moderating our call. I'm gonna stop sharing the screen for a minute um, so that I can see. Um, so Shane is going to be moderating, moderating the call kind of from behind the scenes. So if you are someone who has a question or a comment that you want to make verbally, you use the, the um, there should be a, a, like a reaction area on your, um, on your screen where it would allow you to raise your hand and Shane will take note of your name and then he'll verbally call on you. Um, so that each of you would have an opportunity to participate verbally. If you are not interested in participating verbally, you are more than welcome to, to put your information in the chat. We will be um, answering those questions either tonight or um, like I said, building um, a frequently asked questions page to answer the questions. Now, I am gonna ask for some patience and grace tonight. We right now ourselves have more questions than answers. 
So you are very likely going to ask me questions that I do not have an answer for, but we need to know what the questions are so we can plan for them. So please do not become frustrated. If I say that's a great question, we'll make note of it and add it to our planning. Um, if I know the answer, I will tell you the answer um, tonight, full well knowing that as we continue to plan, that things may shift and change uh, based on what we learn from OSPR regulatory agencies or even what we learn as we continue to have more community forums and surveying opportunities. So with that, I'm gonna take a deep breath and I'm gonna let Shane Edinger moderate. All right, thank you, Michelle. Um, we have, so far we have one person with a raised hand. So we will ask uh, Jolene to ask her question. Hi, Miss Whitney. Hi, how are you? Good to see you. Good, how are you? Great. So I was gonna ask, I have two questions for you. So do we know yet if the SPED students are going to have more of the normal school hours since the disruption in like a rotated schedule would be very difficult for them not only in their academics but in their social emotional learning but also how is para support going to work for those students who need more of the one-on-one -on -one support so both of those are great questions so the ospi guidance specifically calls out special education students in their last frequently asked questions document as a consideration for districts recognizing that they have unique needs so that's definitely a consideration that's on our radar screen, as is para-support. So on, during the week of July 13th through the 17th, we have a series of focus groups meeting where those specialized areas like special education will have some job-alike employees, parents, community, et cetera, working together in some focus group scenarios, recognizing that what you said is true, that our special education students need something especially designed for them. Um, so that definitely is a consideration. It's on our radar screen and uh, we have a mechanism by which we have experts around special education that are prepared to meet in a focus group during that week to do some planning around that. But it's a great question. It's on our radar screen um, and we absolutely need to dig in that, dig into that with the experts in the focus group in July. Well, wonderful. Thank you. If I could ask just one more real quick. Sure. What about face shields for paras? I know you mentioned teachers when they're instructing, but what about paras? You know, it's a great question. So the guidance says that anyone who enters a school must wear a face covering. So if you're a visitor that comes into the school and you provide your own face covering, you can provide either a mask or potentially a face shield. Um, we need to think about what would we have like in the office for those people who accidentally show up and maybe forgot theirs in the car or forgot theirs at home. Um, but that is a great question and one that we'll have our public health guidance team dig into when they're doing their focus group work. Um, but that is a great question. I, I'm going to give you my personal editorial opinion, which is dangerous in, um, as a superintendent, but I'm going to do it anyway. I think the more of us who are around kids, where kids can see our face, the better. And if we have the flexibility to do that while maintaining safety for everyone, that would be my preference as a superintendent. So, um, I wore a face shield all for about a four or six, four hour meeting one afternoon. Um, and the difference for me in interacting with the employees here um, with a face shield on versus a mask was just in terms of my own feeling of satisfaction and participating in the meeting couldn't have been more night and day to the positive. So um, I know for me personally, the face shield is, is, is the preferred uh, face covering. So that would, is again my editorial opinion as a superintendent but we'll have to follow the guidance well you're my boss so i'll do what you said <laughs> <laughs> so good to see you thank you for being here thank you okay next we have josie hi josie hi um so i have a question in regards to um like the high school has programs, say like the auto mechanic classes and whatnot. So how are, how are we going to look into having those kids start a new program? Like 
So my son would want to start that program, but the kids didn't really get to finish the program last year. So how do how are they going to work with that? I guess that's where I'm trying to think how that's going to work. So Josie, do you mean in terms of because he didn't get the experience, didn't learn the things in like the first year to, to go like into the advanced class? Or are you thinking like just kind of logistically, how does that class work? So I'll, I'll tackle both questions. Um, <laughs> so we made the determination last year that um, students would move to the next course in the sequence. So if your student was in like first year auto mechanics and they want to be in second year auto mechanics, they're going to move to second year auto mechanics. The teacher will need to, they, he knows where the first year kids left off and what they need to do in order to successfully participate in second year. And our teachers are ready to make those adjustments to their course scope and sequence and programs. So I would expect that that would happen in auto mechanics. In terms of the logistics for auto mechanics, you would, you would walk in, students would be at least, least six, feet apart, six feet apart, they would either, either have on a mask or a face covering, and there would need to be some consideration for shared materials. So they may need to wipe down the wrench with a, some kind of a disinfectant before they put it away. Um, but, but I believe that there would be um, protocols that could be in place that would allow that experience to be a high quality experience for kids in auto mechanics. So Josie, I hope that answered your question. Okay, next we have Christina. Hi, Christina. Hi, I have a question. Just, you mentioned choir earlier. And I want to know how band is going to work and all this, because pretty much at this point, my son said he won't go back to school or finish if he can't do band and marching band. Yeah, we 100% we recognize that music is a, is a draw and a tie for a lot of kids. A lot of kids feel exactly the way you do. Matter of fact, I've been on many a phone call with families and, and employees where I can hear their Pasco School District students in the background playing their instruments. Um, we have a particular employee um, in our district who every morning meeting or every meeting that I'm on with them, I can hear this, the family or the kids playing music in the background. So we 100% recognize how important that is to kids. I mentioned the focus groups from that week of July 13th through the 17th, and that is a specialized group that we're going to need to engage our, our band and choir teachers and music teachers about how, how can we um, protect as much as we can about that experience for kids given the compliance requirements. And so, you know, we have phenomenal music teachers who I have every confidence will roll up their sleeves around that guidance and do the very best they can for students. Um, I think the thing we need to keep our eye on is this is, this is how things are right now. And our goal is to move through this, this time in our community to a place where we get back to more and more and more normal. So we wanna build a foundation for our kids to participate in music while we kind of are in a holding pattern waiting for us to be able to do, have more and more flexibility. So I know our music teachers will have great ideas for us and they're absolutely gonna be a focus group because we have to know from them how they, because they're the experts, they know where the flexibility is. I will say over the spring, I was on Zoom calls with as many teachers as would let me and I was on a couple of different music calls um, and our teachers did some really incredible things via Zoom and um, making the best of a really challenging environment with our kids. Matter of fact, one young man being with his music class was so important that he was actually on it. I think, well, he was doing harvest while he was checking in with his, his music teacher. So while I don't um, condone driving while on Zoom, um, I did think it spoke volumes to that student's commitment. So we absolutely know it's important to our students and we'll engage our teachers um, to dig into the details of how to make that happen. I do have one other question. My son isn't IEP anymore. He's on 504 and the distance learning did not work for us. And he's gonna take classes I know nothing about this summer. How will that be addressed in those focus groups? So we recognize that our IEP and 504 students, um, we, again, that's a group of parents that we heard from 
via survey, individually and via email, that our process for supporting them needs to look differently. So, um, like I said, on during those focus groups, there'll be uh, one that's special education 504 and students with accommodations. How do we best meet those needs while in whatever approach is most appropriate for us, um, given our, our local health context. So we, we absolutely understand and have heard from parents who've given us lots of great suggestions via email and survey um, comments. So we'll get those in the hands of our focus groups and get a, a definitive um, or a more streamlined protocol and process in place for families. That answered most of my questions, thanks. Thank you, Christina. Okay, next up is Thompson. Hi there. Hi, my name's Jamara. I'm um, I, uh, Thompson and I am uh, a um, essential worker healthcare provider. Mm -hmm. so it was extremely difficult this year with the SPED kid and a 504 kid with not, I'm not home. Um, and I'm also a single parent. So I'm just wondering about, as you consider those of us who are working um, to take care of the community, that we are seriously challenged with homeschooling our children and um, especially when they have special needs and how you guys consider that also into the situation. Yeah, I really appreciate that comment. I appreciate that you came on tonight to, to remind us of that. We also heard that through our surveys. It came up in the collaborator group. Um, I did see a comment in the chat about childcare. I do want to be very clear that um, that we understand the responsibility or the request from our community to offer child care. We're currently engaged in a conversation with Boys and Girls Club to partner around child care. Um, the question in the chat, it sounded like that perhaps there was some confusion that teachers would be providing child care. Teachers will be teaching and child care will be a conversation that we have with some of our third party um, partners. And, you know, child care is a place we're going to need the community to lean in with us. And we're going to need them to lean in on behalf of the school district in support of you as parents. Um, I've already been in contact with Boys and Girls Club and we'll continue to engage with them. But any of you who have great ideas about who I should be reaching out to to help us with the child care ask, please, please um, send me an email or put it in the chat because I would be happy to do that. As a school district, we don't often admit out loud the places where we need help. And we need to be better at that. And I'm telling you, this is a place where we need help. Child care is going to be a place where we need that, like I said, the community to lead our community partners to lean in with us. Um, and then thank you again for the, uh, the reminder about the, being very specific and cognizant about meeting the needs of those students who need specialized instruction. We appreciate the, the reminder. Thank you, I appreciate that. And I just wanted to also mention that um, for me, I have elderly parents. And so I chose to take my kids out of Boys and Girls Club to decrease the risk of exposure, but meaning they're not good homeschoolers. So just mm -hmm. a thought. Thank you for that. Okay, next up is Heidi. Okay. Hello, my name is Heidi. Um, I have a couple questions. So first question is, are you guys going to provide um, shields and masks for the children? And my second question is, um, how is, how is it going to affect the children that are um, with disabilities. Like for an example, I have a daughter that is verbal, but also um, requires um, ASL um, school. So her teacher is deaf. How, it, how is that gonna work? Yeah, so great question. Um, face coverings, we, you know, we'll ask if parents can send their student with a face covering of their choice, maybe kids wanted to pick out their own masks or they have a particular face shield that they really like and parents want to send their kids with those that equipment we are not going to tell parents they can't if if that's something as families they want to do 
we absolutely would allow that. If parents are, would choose not to send their, their children to school with that equipment, we're prepared to, be, to provide it. Um, so that answers question one. Question two around how this impacts students who are in our ASL program or with teachers or that are, have, are deaf of hard of hearing. I appreciate that you brought it up because there are four exclusions to the face covering requirement and one of them is for staff who are um, deaf or hard of hearing um, or there are certain disabilities, people with respiratory um, issues, et cetera. But there are some exceptions to the requirement for um, a face covering, but that, that plastic face shield was also the flexibility in that so that students can see staff's face and we can see their face um, is the, the flexibility that was offered for, for those populations of people that it's really important for us to be watching your mouth. And here, here's the thing, I even think about, you know, I know some people who maybe aren't labeled um, deaf or hard of hearing or taking advantage of our ASL class, but over time, you know, as some of our, we get older or, you know, whatever's going on, like some of the people that I know watch other people's mouths and you wouldn't even know that they had an issue with hearing. So that being able to see someone's mouth while they're talking is very important. Again, that's why I am so grateful that the Department of Health and Labor and Industries recognized that allowing the flexibility for adults in the system to wear a plastic face shield was a game changer for our, um, the environment that we can create. Now, again, it's not, you know, ideal would be we don't have to do anything, but in the absence of the ideal, the flexibility for the clear plastic face shield, um, we felt like offers a lot in terms of um, meeting people's needs with that have um, some disabilities or, or, or issues like that. Did that get your question, Heidi? Oh, yes, it did. Um, also, parent, uh, parenting and homeschooling five kids with um, different disabilities was extremely hard. It was the most hardest thing that I could ever go through. Yes. So I appreciate everything that you guys have done for our kids. Well, it's our honor, Heidi, and um, you know, honestly, we wished it could have been more. Um, and and we fully recognize the impact to families, and you know, our hearts break being in this isolated environment. If I was in a in person meeting with you, I'd give you a hug right now, Heidi. Thank you for everything you did for your kids and your grace and patience with us as a school district as we worked our way through this very very complicated set of circumstances. So here, I'm sending you a hug, Heidi, right here. <laughs> Thank you. I sent you one back. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, next is Katie D. Uh, okay. Hold on. We're doing something down now. Katie D should be Hi able. There, Katie D. Hi, Katie. Do you have to unmute her, Shane? Good. <laughs> now she's. Um, hey, sorry. Is this working? Yes. yes. Hi, Katie. Oh, okay. Hi, um, our son is going to be a kindergartner this year, and so we're new to the school district, and we're new to all of this. Now we're learning online. I have no idea what's going on. Um, so we just wanted to know, like, when the kindergarten screenings will be this year, um, and then we were in the process of early learning center evaluations when the pandemic hit, and we don't know what's going on now. So. Okay. Can you let us know like where we are with that whole process if we were kind of in the middle of it and then? Yes, absolutely. We can totally help you. So um, at the beginning um, that Jenny Richardson, Jay Richardson at PSD1.org, did you write, did you write that email down? Yeah. Um, so Jay Richardson at psd1.org, email her immediately after this or even right this second, 
and she's my assistant and we'll get you connected with the right people to get all your questions answered. So Great. I was a former kindergarten teacher. So like there's nothing better in the world than when you as parents send your kid to kindergarten. So I'm here to help you. Don't you worry for one minute. We'll get it worked out. And then you'll have to let me know when your kindergartner is and I'll go check them out on the first days of school because I love it. That's my favorite thing in the universe to do. Yeah, he's well, he's going to be at Three Rivers. Um, That's all right. We're, we're not sure, you know, about whether like online, like how that would, you know, whether that's the right option, you know, yeah. for somebody that young and sure. so are there Ooh. orientations for this? I don't. <laughs> yeah, I'll get you connected with all the people that you need to be connected with to make some decisions and we'll, we'll help you through it. Okay. They're super smart people that have heart and passion for this work and we'll, we'll get you connected with them. Jenny Richardson, Jay Richardson at PSD1, that's your gateway to the, to the experts. We'll get you connected. Great, thank you. Thanks so much. You betcha. Yeah, my pleasure. Okay, next is Adriana. I think it was a pretty simple question. Yeah, like, how do you Hello. Hi, Adriana. Hello. Um, I was wondering about IT support. Okay. Because um, uh, I had a lot of issues um, kind of come up, and we tried to figure it out, and we did a lot of rebooting of computers. <laughs> um, but that only did so much. So are you going to, like, in case we, are, we do do the homeschooling, is there, like, some sort of, like, IT process where um, they could get help with like computer issues specifically? Because most of like, they just had older computers, so I think they were just acting up, but um, that made it really difficult <laughs> when your computer. Sure. Yeah, so um, this spring we had our uh, IT department uh, available like on a helpline. Our principals were offering some IT support. Um, but I think your point's a really good one, especially if we're on some kind of a rotation schedule so that maybe students could bring their computer on the day that they're at school and maybe have some kind of quick turnaround on some IT support right when the student's at school. So I think it's a great thing for us to think about how do we add on layers of support to the support that we offered in the spring. Um, so I think that that's a great thing for us to think about um, and we'll make sure that the technology focus group, Susan, um, I'm saying Susan, because she's going to be in charge of those focus groups, um, has that as a consideration. I think that that's a, a, a great request for how we can do that better and more streamlined for you. I think the other piece, and this won't help with the rebooting and all of that, but our goal around streamlining the number of different platforms that you have to access and streamline of all of that, all, our goal is to streamline that to a primary platform limit the different programs, et cetera, to try to make that a little bit easier for you too. So not only will we have a, um, supports in place for technical support for the actual device itself, but we also want to try to narrow how many different things you have to ha know how to navigate. Yes, that would be super useful. I mean, like me personally, I was able to help a little bit because some of the programs that, um, that they were using, I use them through my work, but I can, easily see it being chaotic for somebody who's never used those programs before because yeah it's a whole basically learning a whole new program and especially if there's a whole bunch of different ones so that i, I that one made me really happy that you guys were focusing on that too <laughs> thank you yeah it's our thank you that it was a, a huge ask across the board whether it was students families or teachers everyone said that was important to them in all three categories and groups so we'll dig in and do that work Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for being here. Okay, so we've got lots and lots of questions in the chat. We're never going to be able to get through them all. So we will definitely put together a frequently asked questions uh, document that we will be sharing with everybody to get to answers all of those questions. Uh, but there is one or there are quite a few, as I said, um, one that stuck out uh, that you haven't touched on upon yet, Michelle, was uh, what about transportation to and from school? Uh, how does social distancing um, impact that? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I, and I have to be honest when I tell you there's a lot more questions around transportation than answers. But I will tell you what the guidance says. So the guidance says that um, 
bus driver and students need to be wearing a mask. We need to increase ventilation in the bus by, you know, if that's opening windows, etc. We need to be thoughtful about how long students are on buses. The six foot social distancing requirement is not as important on buses as it is in the classroom. So I could imagine that of the 130 of you on the call, you maybe are kind of doing the eyebrow raise like that doesn't make sense to me. And I understand that. So I'm going to tell you the rationale I was given, not because I'm defending it or, or I'm just telling, I'm going to tell you the facts I was, or the, the information I was given. This, the preventative measures, the requirements that the Department of Health have put in place are what they call cumulative. So you have on a mask and you're on the bus or you have on a face covering and you're on the bus. So that, that protects you some. You have the open windows, that's protecting you some. You do your best to stay away from each other the best that you can on the bus, that protects you some. And we try to limit the amount of time that you're on the bus. So you're not on the bus together for, four, for an hour or four hours. So the social distancing six foot apart becomes less important on the bus due to the duration and the increased ventilation than in a classroom where students are sitting for potentially hours, two hours next to each other. So that becomes why it's more important in a classroom to keep kids six feet apart because they're closer to each other for a longer period of time. So our buses, don't necessarily have to adhere to the six foot social distancing, but there will be a mask requirement and increased ventilation. Um, the piece that I'm we're unclear about, but we'll have to work out is the health asked at the health screening. Like at what point does that happen? How do we verify all of that, those pieces for, for um, students to get on the bus? And then of course, we wanna make sure that there's um, protections in place for our bus drivers who are on the bus for extended periods of time where kids are getting on and off the bus driver stays on the bus for an extended period of time. So we want to make sure there's potentially they wear a mask and a face shield and we get like maybe those guard things that you see like now they have them at Starbucks the plastic thing so that you so those are all the different considerations for transportation. Um, that is an area where there definitely is still more questions than answers and an area where we're really gonna dig in, have to dig in with some focus groups to figure out what makes most sense in Pasco School District. I will say the other piece that's in the guidance from OSPI is encouraging those families who can to transport or encouraging those kids who can walk to walk or ride their bikes or, or skateboards or rollerblades or whatever kids are doing. Um, and that, that transportation really be for, for families who have absolutely no other way of getting their students to school. Now, I'm not sure how I feel about that guidance. Um, I have some mixed feelings about it, but I am sharing it with you as it is um, regularly shared by OSPI um, as, as some strategies that they ask districts and families to consider. Okay, back to our folks with their hands up. <laughs> we have uh, Lisa. Lisa, I am allowing you to talk now. Thank you. Um, we just had a, a somewhat simple question in the sense of as we're exploring the online options that may be available to our children instead of traditional school, um, would this compromise their placements in the special program? As I understand it, I have to withdraw them from the school that they are in to enroll them in the online program, um, which of course we don't want to lose out or the time when traditional school comes back. So do you have any clarification or direction on that approach? Um, it's a great question. Can you give me an example of what you mean by special program? Yes, one is in spectrum and one is in Delta. Yeah, I think that's a great question. So here's what we wouldn't want to have happen as any student lose out on an opportunity because of the COVID environment. So I, I understand the question, understand the concern and certainly we would not, again, it kind of goes back to the common sense, you know, we're leading with compassion, common sense, communication and collaboration. You know, common sense would tell us that we shouldn't penalize a student for the need for flexibility during a pandemic. So I think it's a great question to bring up and one that um, I can work closely with Deb Thurston. Susan, if you'll write that down um, to make sure that we build in a protocol that really honors those students being awarded those positions. I, I, I think it's a great question. And I appreciate you bringing it up because I could see us losing sight of a detail like that. 
that really is extraordinarily important. So I, I do appreciate that. And Susan's making note of it. I can see her shaking her head. <laughs> She's written it down and we'll make sure that we build that into the protocol or their, or the um, process. Okay. Um, who, who do you suggest we keep in contact with to see that through? So for, and, and are you specifically talking about like for IPAL or the K5 Virtual Academy, those? Yeah. So that's Deb Thurston. And it's just D T H U R S T O N. Did I get that right, Susan? I, at PSD one yes, Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Deb Thurston. And in the IPAL pieces are on the website too. They're pretty easy to find, and our contact information is there. It's also on the survey, I believe, that we sent yes. um, out. But yeah, the IPAL is pretty easy to find on our website also. But Deb Thurston's email um, would work. There's also an IPAL email. It's just IPAL at PSD1.org. That would be another great one. Okay. Thank you. Oh, my oh. pleasure, Lisa. Thank you. All right. Uh, next up, we have Sergio with a question. So while Sergio is unmuting, I just wanted to highlight Questions like that, insights like that, that you have as parents are exactly why we do these forums. That is a detail that we, I would have missed. And it's a detail that is so important. So this is exactly when I, I say the best ideas I've ever had as a superintendent, a principal, as a teacher I've gotten from parents. So we just really appreciate your, your willingness to show up and give us some of your insights and how we can do better for you. So Sergio. Hi, Michelle. How's it going? Great. How are you? I you recognize good. your voice. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, we actually have two questions. Great. And the first one is, um, we run into a problem during the spring, and we had um, the laptop that it was assigned to our high school um, students. They were underpowered for some of the um, online office, Microsoft Office applications. And so one of them um, crashed. And so anyways, uh, it almost took two weeks to get a turnaround. And once we finally got a laptop, um, the customized applications were not available. My question is, is there a way to buy a licensing or extra licenses for that specialized software where we can install that software in our own personal laptops? Oh, that's a great question. And I don't know the answer to it, but Susan's gonna write it down and we're gonna put it to our focus, tech focus group. It's a great okay. question. And then my wife has the other question. <laughs> okay. Hi, Whitney. Um, Hi there. My name is Myrna. I I have a question because I'm I'm kind of nervous about the whole in-home learning um, ideas that are being thrown out. Um, but if we must do it, uh, one of the things that we had issues with at home is uh, both my husband and I work, and um, we're not here to help the kids. Uh, but I was able to stay home a couple of days a week, one day a week, and um, doing the Zoom meetings with my kids. They weren't really instructional. It was more, it was more like a check-in, how are you guys doing kind of thing. Um, they never really were taught anything, but they were assigned a lot of work where the kids didn't really know the material, you know. So um, I'm wondering if you guys have something in place for the new year, if we do the 2.0 learning, um, is there gonna be more teaching than there was during the spring? So I think, I'm sorry. Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> so I think we learned a lot from the spring um, and you know our teachers did an amazing job calibrating their instruction in really like 24 hours um, to an environment that we were all very, very unfamiliar with. We've learned a lot. Um, many of our hundreds of our teachers have engaged with a consultant called Jeff Utech, whose really fundamental core purpose <laughs> is to empower um, learning using technology. So, and I'm, I'm like literally saying hundreds of our teachers took those trainings already this spring. We've been in contact with Jeff Utech to do some specialized trainings for Pasco School District teachers. And we're even getting to the point now where we're identifying teacher leaders to also do training and build capacity. So I think with time and training, things will improve around instructional technology delivery. 
and then, you know, just recognizing that it all happened so quickly. Initially, I think we all believed, or at least I very naively believed that we would be back to school on April 27th. I think there was no one more shocked than me when that didn't happen. Um, and like I said, I think we learned a lot in the spring. We've now identified some experts in the field in Jeff Utech who are partnering with us to help us learn even more. And our teacher leaders and, and technology leaders are really leaning in to help their colleagues. So I would fully expect there to be some growth and learning and really for it to be that improvement that I talked about and not improvement as a criticism, but improvement in recognition that when we know, when we know more, we do, when we know better, we do better. Um, and I think this was a, a more of a, a knowing gap versus a, a doing gap. So um, I, I fully expect that, that we'll have a, that at home 2.0 in place in the fall. I really hope that our students get to go back to school in the fall, but if, if we were to have to stay at home, then yeah, definitely. I, I hope that we can come up with a better process. And thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you. And I'm with you. I hope we can be back together in the fall. I'm still hoping for a miracle, you know, that this all of a sudden on, you know, July 14th, I just like it all changes and is better and it's over. Like, that's my hope. It, it, it is really like a light switch, not like a dial. So I'm going to keep putting that hope out into the universe and, and see if we can make it happen. So hugs for everyone. That's what I can't wait for the day. Hugs for everybody. I can hardly wait. Okay, our next question comes from Denise. Hi, Denise. Hi, um, I work for um, the Support Advocacy and Resource Center, SARC, and we do presentations in schools usually. Um, and so now I'm just wondering, how is how's that going to work out? Are, are they still gonna allow presenters to come in and teach? Um, or are they going to be doing, I mean, we are working on doing Zoom recordings, but I just wasn't sure how, what you thought of that or how have you thought, gone into planning about that? You know, I, I haven't given thought yet to our community partners. What I know is we got offers from a number of community partners that, that over the spring and the summer um, or the spring that we did not capitalize and maximize because of just the, the robust lift of getting all the pieces in place. So I think we missed some opportunities to partner, for example, with the fire department. They had a, a, some really innovative ideas about how we could have partnered with them. Um, so I would be really interested in that dialogue, Denise. So um, if you could email Jenny Richardson, um, sure, we can like figure out how to get you connected with the right people. I think we need to, it's like I said before, I think as a school district, we don't always do the best job saying, hey, we need help. And I, I think this is an area where we obviously need your help. We've um, valued your partnership in the past, and now we just need to think creatively about how we honor that in this new environment. Um, so definitely, if you could email Jenny, I can get you connected with the right people. Great. So we already have schedules. Oh, so great. It would just be a matter of figuring out how that's going to work. and. We'll definitely email her and see what her thoughts are. Yeah, that would be great. Or she'll she'll just help me get you connected to the right people, Denise, but that's a great question. Perfect. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, uh, next is Lisa G. Hi. Hi. I have two questions. Uh -oh. Oh, no, now she's back. <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> okay, two questions. I hope I didn't miss this earlier. Um, how are you imagining the dual language program looking? And second of all, do you picture this, I don't know how to say this, so um, with some choice about how schedules go. So let's say we choose to go half day, Monday through Thursday, and it's either morning or afternoon, or every other day, or something like that. Will there be, will parents have some ability to choose which they do, like morning or afternoon, or which days they go uh, to kind of work around the other things, work, whatever that is, or what are you guys picturing? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, I, I envision as much parent collaboration as possible. 
Um, but it's a great question in terms of we have not built in the mechanism for you to, to, to do all of that yet. Um, but I, I, like I said, I, I would like to collaborate with families as much as we possibly can um, because we understand that there's work scheduling and, and potential childcare scheduling and, you know, siblings being on the same rotation scheduling and so on and so forth. So I know it's on our mind. Um, I can't tell you how exactly that's going to happen, but definitely flexibility for families is a core value that we have and a lens that we're viewing this work through. Um, so it's, it's on our radar screen. Um, and we'll just have to continue to build out exactly what that's going to look like. Um, knowing that it's going to be very complicated, but it's our obligation to try to build in as much flexibility as possible for parents and families. And then the second one was the dual language program. Oh, yes. So, you know, I have to be really honest about that. I know that there's some conversation happening around um, needing to in, envision that differently, um, but I would need to do some research with our um, program. Alma Duran and Raul Sital, Maria Sandoval are in charge of that. I know they were working on some pieces, um, but I don't know the details of that, but it's a great question and one that we can make sure that we answer in the frequently asked questions and get posted after this. Um, and I'm and I'm sorry that I can't track the details of that, but I do know that there were groups of people talking about it and and needing to think about how this might look different, especially if this is a more longer term situation for our dual language kids. So we'll get you that that information. Thank you. Yeah. And if Lisa, if you wanted to email Jenny Richardson, I could also get you connected to if 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 you'd like, I would be happy to do that. That's very nice of you. Um, it's actually for a friend of mine. My car, kids aren't in it. She just couldn't attend tonight. Well, so you we'll have to give her, give her Jenny Richardson's email and have her email Jenny and I'll get her connected to the right folks. Okay, thank you. You betcha. Okay, uh, next question from April. So what was a gamble Hello. like where you guys are going to show up on my screen? Sometimes at the bottom, sometimes at the middle. There she is. Hi, April. Where'd she go? Hi, April. Hey, did that work? Yes. I can even Sorry. see your my face. How exciting. Yay. So um, I kind of have two questions and I hope that you can hear me well. And if not, please let me know and I can type it or something. Nope, I can um, hear the heart of the hard of hearing thing with the with the face coverings, um, I just wanted to extend upon that. I know adults and children as well, and so the grace was given to have a face shield. However, that doesn't help if, like you know, I rely on mouth movements, and if you're wearing a mask, or if a child chooses to come in with a mask because that's their choice, I can't see their face or more importantly, speech impediments if we need to refer them to speech. So I was wondering how that would look or what we could do about that. Yeah, it's a great question, April. And I think one that we'll have to kind of ferret out and, and do some thinking around. You know, I, I, yeah, we'll just have to think that through because you're right, there is some choice there, um, but there is some, you know, needs based there. So it would really be kind of a case by case circumstance. You know, if the teacher, is deaf of hard of hearing, you know, then we need the kids to wear the face shield. But if I'm a parent and I want my kid to wear a face mask, like those are just details we're gonna have to be really thoughtful. Um, and again, go back to the lens that we're viewing this work through, compassion and communication. So let's sit down case by case, figure it out, look at it through the lens of compassion and communication and collaboration and really dig into what the best options are. But it's great. Those are the details that I think are really important and I appreciate that you brought it up. Um, we're gonna to have to work through that. Yeah, you're welcome because I think that you've got different groups and sometimes like, you know, you have more you have more insight than another group and then teachers have another insight, parents have another insight, parents have another insight. So I think yeah. it's important that we're listening to all of that. Um, but the second one I had was the calendar and I know we're still working that out. Has it, has there ever been like a choice or discussion about instead of starting in August to start in September or anything like that? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, the calendar, we bargain with our teachers union. So there's that piece. There's also um, 
the there is some guidance around the um, calendar from OSPI who talked about building in some like almost like snow days, but COVID days in case the school district had to close for, you know, a certain amount of time for cleaning and, you know, there, so th there's just some considerations around, do we build in some COVID days? So the 180 days is like longer and extended. So there's just some work around the calendar that's going to need to be done. And, you know, the, the calendar is a mandatory subject to bargain. So we would work in collaboration with our teachers union around that. I mean, it's, it's a great question and um, one that we would need to dig into. I think the piece that we have to keep our eye on is right now, OSPI is requiring compliance to the 180 days and the 1027. So whatever calendar we build in, we need to assume that we're going to have to meet that compliance requirement of 180 days and the 1027 hours. Um, the only way we'd be able to waive days like we did this time is under a governor's proclamation. Well, that doesn't exist for 2020, 2021 yet, if it ever will. So um, that's probably the only kind of for sure piece about the calendar is meeting the 180 days. The rest of it is a, um, you know, a collaboration and a, a mandatory subject of bargaining. Okay, thank you. And thank you everybody and, and parents and community members. I appreciate hearing all you guys too, because I wore a lot of hats. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, April. Okay, next is W. Brock. Hi, I'm Wendy. Uh, Hi. I just had a question because, well, it's really more of an ask. When you go to a primary platform, would it be possible to make sure that parents have access to all of the learning materials and that that the teacher is using? Because as a parent of a high school student, this last spring, it was really difficult. One teacher was like, it's okay to take a picture of this with your phone and text it to me. One wanted you to email it, one wanted it on Teams. She would turn things in and four or five times she had to turn it in in order to get it graded. And shout out to uh, Mr. Clayton and Mr. Glenn. I know you're not allowed to talk about, uh, about teachers at Chiawana, but I can say that those guys were really awesome with the uh, music students. But um, the difficulty with getting all of her things so that I knew what she was supposed to be completing along with her figuring out what she was supposed to be completing, it would be, um, that to me, that's really important. I was glad to hear that that was a, a thing across the board. Oh yeah, it was huge. And you, then you take, you know, families who have multiple kids. And um, so what we call that, so there's a learning platform, a primary platform, and then we've been working on identifying what's called the core four. And that's part of this Jeff Utech piece. And um, so, and that all really then aligns with common expectations. And so we did hear that really frequently that having multiple teachers with multiple different expectations and trying to navigate multiple ways to turn in our assignments just became very overwhelming for families. And so we 100% hear you. Um, and we're working really hard on that in collaboration with our teachers and um, with the support of, of Jeff Utech. So um, we're, we're looking forward to it being more streamlined in the fall. If, if indeed that's, we're having to do an at-home learning 2.0. Well, thank you for that. And I just want to let you know um, of one of the guys I work with, his son is in high school over in Richland School District and he had the same frustration. So it's not just your district and that, and, and that I just, it was very frustrating to not be able to keep track of all of that and, and trying, trying to figure out what was going on at a given point in time. So if parents could have the ability to see that, that would be awesome, thanks. No, thank you. We appreciate that. Thank you so much. And I appreciate you letting it know, you know, it wasn't just me or it wasn't just us. <laughs> and honestly, you know, I, I have been on multiple calls with superintendents across the state and we're really all challenged in dealing with the same, the same situations. And, um, but the good news is with collaboration and having people work shoulder to shoulder, we can find the best ideas that are unique for our community, what our community needs from us. So we appreciate your guys' cooperation and collaboration. Uh, Kathy is next with the question. Hi, Kathy. Hi, Michelle. Thanks for all the great communication. I'm impressed with how well the school district is keeping us informed and making all these huge decisions. That 
Thank you for saying that. A lot of information, a lot of things changing and a lot of unknowns still. You guys are doing a terrific job. Thank you. Yeah. The, the question I have is I'm wondering how the district may be considering the situation of staff with higher risk older family members at home and the risks involved. Yeah, so it's interesting, just ironic, Kathy, as you asked the question, it got asked in the chat. So, um, so we as a school district accommodate for the health needs of our staff as just a regular course of business. So we, on any given day in our organization, have people who work through an accommodation process mm -hmm. if they have a diagnosis of some kind and we accommodate their work functions based on what we can. Um, so really the process for supporting a high, uh, an employee in the high risk group is really no different than a process that we would use in a normal situation if someone comes to us and has a, a physical condition that either permanently or um, temporarily limits their ability to do their regular job functions. So for example, if I'm a grounds crew person and my job is to mow the lawn and spray for weeds and I break my leg, I may need an accommodation for a short period of time. Um, if I have a, a chronic health condition as a teacher, I may need accommodated for a longer period of time. So the good news is we're practiced at doing that for our employees. The challenging news is that this now is potentially a volume of employees that, that is larger than what we typically accommodate in a normal school year. Um, and I kind of go back to, and the good news is I have a phenomenal HR team who's already putting those processes in place um, utilize them through the spring and into the summer. We learned a lot again. There was great things that happened. There were communication gaps that we had to, had to um, troubleshoot and kind of tie back and those kinds of things. Um, but, and I, and I focus mostly on flexibility for families on this PowerPoint and the information I delivered to you tonight. But we also want to have flexibility for our high risk employees and we'll work through a process with our individual employees and our labor partners to make sure that we can accommodate for people who are in those high risk groups. And it's, it's going to be a heavy lift. It's going to be complicated. It's going to be case by case. And, um, you know, our ultimate goal is to honor our employees and keep them safe. And, and I know with, we have good relationships with our labor partners and I know that we'll lean in it to it together and, and utilize the process we already have to do that. Um, like I said, we utilize the process this spring and into the summer um, and just like anything else that's new, we, we learned a lot and, and we'll continue to refine those processes and moving them forward. But it's a great, great question. Yeah, so um, I'm wondering about the situation of staff with higher risk older family members at home. Um, yeah, it's a great question, Kathy. Yes. And, <laughs> and to be honest, I'm not sure what options we're going to have for that. Um, we'll need uh -huh. to dig a little deeper into the um, at-risk group um, and health accommodations that are outlined for us through LNI and Department of Health. Um, uh -huh. But again, our goal is to offer as much flexibilities to families based, based on their, to employees based on their circumstances. So, um, I think it's a hard question to answer right now with one yeah. without knowing the individual circumstances and then knowing what flexibility we have under the, the compliance and state or the regulatory guidance, but we'll certainly be digging into that in partnership with our families. Yeah. So if you know someone, have them reach out to myself and I'll get them connected with the right people. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, hit the wrong button. Okay, <laughs> um, Aaron is next. Hi, Aaron. Hello. Um, so I have my daughter. She was at kindergarten this year, so going to be a first grader. And I think the biggest challenge we had was, you know, keeping her engaged and learning. You know, she wanted to learn from her her teacher and not her parents at all. And um, so, I, and I think part of it is obviously missing the social interaction, but maybe some thing to keep in mind is what kind of recognition pro, uh, programs, you know, things could we do to keep the students engaged in learning? She was a student of Mark Twain, you know, I know they had like the Cat Cash and the, the Aurora program, and I think they were just, you know, she was missing some of that. 
Oh, that's a great, great insights as a parent, great suggestion. That came up at one of the stakeholder groups, the state level stakeholder group I was on about how do we better partner as a school system with our families around those positive reinforcements and incentives. So it's great insight, Erin, and I appreciate that you brought it up. And the only other thing I'd say um, or advocate for is, uh, you know, obviously my child's on the end of the spectrum where she's new in school versus I can appreciate high school's another challenge, but having a touch point with a teacher, like office hours type thing, I think would also be very helpful. Oh, thank you for that. I appreciate that suggestion. Okay, um, next is Maria. Hi, Maria Lee. Hello, can you? I can totally hear you. Okay, so. I can't see you, but I can hear you. Well, I couldn't figure out the video, so I apologize for that. What's so my, quest my question for you is, if we're looking at um, an alternative uh, schedule, so maybe it's a couple days with one group of students and then a couple days with a different group of students, and we still have the um, at-home learning occurring at, this, at the same time, what is going to be the expectations as far as a teacher is concerned? We can't possibly be in the same place at the same time. I mean, we can't be doing our normal teaching in person and online as well. What is going to be the expectations or has the district even thought of that? So Maria, it's a great question and exactly why we need to engage some focus groups with teachers in the focus groups during the week of the July 13th and 17th through the 17th. I think it's you guys as teacher experts closest to the work need to help us understand what's reasonable and appropriate. Um, it also came up multiple times in our collaborator groups that if the uh, if we're required, if teachers are doing in person and at home um, the schedule needs to accommodate planning that um, recognizes the responsibility of both. So there was lots of great and deep feedback around that. We obviously would collaborate with teachers around what that could look like. And then any change of working conditions is a mandatory subject of bargain. So we would be, again, um, leaning into that with our labor partners around uh, the bargaining, in, you know, bargaining requirement of that. So we, we fully recognize that. All right, and I do wanted to know, um, what do we need to do to be part of the focus groups? Email me. Okay, thank you. Duly noted, Maria Lee. <laughs> Just shoot me an email so that I don't forget you wanna be a part. I will, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So you guys, I'm gonna tell you a secret, you guys, all 122 of you. I was so nervous for this Zoom virtual meeting because I've never done it before. And I just want to thank you for your patience and um, that I am not as nervous now as I was. Susan Sparks can attest to I was a little bit have I had like a red rash this morning and I was thinking, oh my gosh, I don't know if I can do it. And so I appreciate you guys being a great first Zoom town hall. This was awesome. I might even come back on Wednesday. <laughs> um. Go ahead, oh, Shane. We have one, I was gonna say we were all out of raised hands, but Maria snuck in just at the very end here. <laughs> Hello, Maria. Hi. Um, I had a, a question. My son is in sixth grade and my daughter is in eighth grade. And because of the way the school system works here, my son was in elementary school. He doesn't have a laptop that the school gave him, but my daughter did. And um, they said that um, if there was a, a laptop in the home, then it was fine that the family could use it. But I'm wondering if you guys continue this um, and let's say both of my kids are at home and both of them have to be at school. And if I only have one laptop, um, how would that work? Yeah, I know I'm also struggling with internet right now, but I'm trying to figure something out with that. Um, but my concern is if I only have one laptop, how how could I do that? Yeah, it's a great comment. And and again, we learned a lot this spring and I, I just huge kudos to our technology department who was ever evolving in their thinking and adding new layers in. I mean, they just did an incredible job um, in 
providing technology support for kids while also, you know, having to spin every employee up to work from home. So one of the, our initial, so every student in middle school and high school already had a one to one. So then mm -hmm. our priority was to deploy laptops to the upper elementary students who didn't already have a laptop in the home mm -hmm. because we, were, we didn't know if we would have enough to give every, all the students a laptop. So then we pushed down, we were like, okay, now we'll, we can, we have enough laptops to do that in the, some of the primary grade levels. Okay, now we can do that in even the, the younger grade levels. And initially the thinking was one per family, but the feedback mm -hmm. was clearly that one per family wasn't working. Um, during the collaborator meetings just recently, our director of technology, Mark Garrett, was in one of the collaborator meetings. He has already made some modifications to the way that we uh, deploy devices that will allow us to do more than one laptop per home next year. So wow. um, we understood that that was a barrier for families and the technology department um, has put in some processes and procedures that would allow more than one laptop per home next year. So we fully understood the impact of that. I just huge kudos to Mark and his team for recognizing the need, figuring out, out a way to, to fill that gap for next year. So um, from my perspective, that that situation has been solved. Um, and, and it's really the, the extraordinary leadership of Mark Garrett and, the, and his team has been incredible. So um, we, we heard you. We understand and, and we'll have it fixed for next year. Thank you so much. That, that's yes. really awesome to hear. Thank you. Well, I'm going to tell him I can hear the smile in your voice. I can totally tell <laughs> that that made you happy. So I'm going to let Mark know. Awesome. Thanks. <laughs> so we have another, um, we have two more of these. Um, I'm going to just wrap up. It is 730. I'm going to do a wrap up and then I'm happy to stick around for, for folks who uh, had any other questions. Um, we did our town hall tonight. We already have a check mark on that one. We have another one tomorrow that is going to be conducted all in Spanish. So if you have any Spanish speaking friends or family who would be more comfortable with a, a forum that's all in Spanish, please tune in for tomorrow. Um, our host will be Susana Reyes in collaboration with board members Jesse Campos and Steve Christensen. And then I'll be back facilitating on June 1st, um, another community forum. So if you have friends or, or know of people that weren't on here tonight on this town hall meeting, invite them to come back or come again or come to the uh, July 1st. If you have questions that you want answered that you didn't get answered or want to participate again, we'd love to see you back. As I mentioned, we're going to then engage based on some of the, on the information you gave us here, plus that, that, that we've already collected. We're going to engage our expert groups in focus collaboration between July 13th through the 17th. We'll be re, uh, presenting a draft of our reopening plan to the school board on July 28th and requesting their approval for that plan on August 11th. We recognize that timeline is tight. It is a timeline that is defined for us by OSPI um, and we always close our meetings with our We Are Pasco slide that does represent our core values around our belief and commitment to standing in the gap and bridging the divide for our students who need us the most and um, really impacting that trajectory of student success. So We Are Pasco is attached to all of us and um, those of us who've been connected to Pasco School District are honored every day to, to provide leadership and support to a community that we all love very much. So thank you for attending, like I said, our very first Zoom meeting um, and uh, being here tonight. So thank you so much. I will stick around if there's something that you need from me. Um, I would be happy to provide it. Um, if you are ready to hang up and leave the call, please just feel free to do that whenever you're ready. And like I said, every, anyone who needs uh, anything from me, I'll stick around for a while. So thank you so much. Well, we've got lots of great questions for an FAQ, Shane. Yes, we do. Um, Katie B is still around and she's had one more question. You oh, bet. That's right. Katie D has an older version of Zoom. So I have to 
take a couple extra steps to help KDD. So it's okay because I'm, I'm teasing KDD because Katie and I know, I know each you. other. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> we were on, yeah, once upon a time. Um, my question was about recess. Um, you know, looking at the beautiful playground we have that's not being used right now uh, across the street. Have, have you guys given any thought to what recess might look like or is recess not going to be on the schedule for younger kids? So my, my current understanding is that recess is absolutely something that our students can do. They just need to stay away from, you know, six, six feet apart. You know, they shouldn't play close to one another. Um, we also understand the guidance around our, um, in, our playground equipment differently than we did before. I think there was a stance initially taken that you shouldn't be on it because we can't disinfect it and all of that. Um, we now know that we can disinfect it once a week, but because it sits out in the sh sunshine, there's less risk to our kids. Um, so the biggest thing with recess will be that social distancing. Um, but honestly, I don't, again, I was a kindergarten teacher. I can teach kids to be six feet apart. Like all you need is some hula hoops, it'll be fine. Um, and the other thing I've asked OSPI for some, some clarification and really pressed OSPI on as they're having conversations with Department of Health is that students, this is again, my opinion, okay, opinion. Um, if students should, is there a possibility of students being allowed to not wear a face mask or a face shield outside? Um, you know, again, I, you know, see people outside at the park and they're not, you know, so I, I, I kind of feel like if, if they're outside, they're away from each other, we can guarantee that, like, I kind of feel like kids should be allowed to take their face masks off and their, their face shield off outside. Now, again, that's my opinion. I don't know the science and research behind that, so don't quote me on it, but um, I do think that again, OS, or there's nothing in the guidance that precludes us from having recess. Kids can use the playground toy. Social distancing still will be required. I'm asking a lot of deep questions around face coverings outside um, and really asking for flexibility there. As long as the science says that it's safe, I don't wanna put in anyone at risk, but certainly um, I think that that would be nice for um, kids to be able to take a little break and run around outside without their face masks or face shields on. Yeah. So recess is a go. Okay. Well, good to know. <laughs> but like I said, can you just reach out to us via email? We'll get you connected to all the right folks and get you supported. Okay. No, I appreciate I've got a great, it. I just, yeah, I've got a great team. Great we'll team and smart life. people. I'm just hoping my son would listen. I don't know. That's his, that's his difficulty is listening to authority. And if you're telling him stay six feet away, I don't know if he would really listen about staying six feet away. So that's where we're at right now with him. Well, so here, here's the thing. Having been a kindergarten teacher, I've sat across the table from many a mom who says the same thing you're just saying, and they come to school and they're different for their teacher than they are their mom and dad. So they're there's that. And then sometimes you got to be uh, innovative with the way that you taught and you teach them about things and make it fun. So our teachers are skilled and, and we'll deal with, with uh, helping them learn the new rules and expectations. Well, that's good. Well, yeah. I will definitely email. Um, it was Jenny, right? Right. Jay Richardson, Richardson. with an O. S O N. <laughs> got it. All right. Well, <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you very of much. Course. It's my pleasure. So I don't know if Faith Hovde is still on the call, but she had specifically asked that I go through some of the um, uh, questions in the chat. If, they're, if you're still on and there's something specific you'd like me to answer, please let me know. She is still on. Faith, if you'd like to raise your hand, we can open your microphone. I, don't, I also don't want to put you on the spot, so you don't have to if you don't want to, but... Um, and she did answer or ask a question here at the end of the chat. Uh, oh. If families decide to do online exclusively, will the child be able to participate in school activities like sports and clubs? Yes. Well, there you go. That was an easy one. <laughs> um, a similar yeah, one that was... Go ahead. When you're a Pasco School District student, and taking advantage of one of our programs, then you call you you have access to all of our of all of the the activities. So that's easy one. So they would be uh, at their home or at their boundary school, correct? That where that would be where they would participate. 
Um, a similar question that was asked earlier was if they, um, if they, if someone enrolls in the online IPAL program, would they lose their spot at their boundary school? So it's a great question. And I think I had Susan write it down and I think it's important for not for the boundary school question. And then all, but, and then the other piece of it was around specialized programs. So I think we just need to, I don't know what we do now. I, I can't imagine that they would lose their spot. I mean, if that's where you live, that's where you live and would go to school. So they would, I'm assuming, you know, you, you opt out, out of IPAL, you go back to your, your boundary school. Um, I just want to verify how that all works, but I'm sure we have students that do that now. Okay. Um, Olga and Scott have a question. Hi, Olga and Scott. Or at least they raised their hand. There they are. Um, should I start talking now? Sure. Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> the ten-year-old saying, "No, you have to unmute." <laughs> Use the technology. Um, yeah, we will likely have to do the online because. Um, we're his, we're guardians, grandparents, guardians to our 10 year old and he has asthma. So that's a pre-existing kind of a, and then both of us have, besides being old, um, a couple of other, other things. So you're wise, you're not old, you're wise. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. But, uh, yeah. So who is it that we contact? Have to find out more about IPEL and then the K-5 Learning Academy, is it the same person? Yep, it's the same person and you can either um, email, it's I-P-A-L Okay, yeah, at, at, mm -hmm. at PSD1.org Okay Or D Thurston, T-H-U-R-S-T-O-N Okay. at psd1.org. Okay. Um, yeah, he just got an IEP, like just in the last three, three weeks. How does something like that work? Yeah, so Deb's going to be your, your very best resource for that because it really is on a case-by-case -case basis dependent on what, thank you, Joy Dawson, for putting that in the chat. Um, it really dependent on what he's receiving services for. So give her, just shoot her an email and get connected with Deb. Deb can answer all those questions for you. The IPAL team is extraordinary over there. They've been doing this IPAL um, environment for, gosh, I don't, maybe like almost 10 years. Okay. Um, so this is not new to them. Um, it's new to this conversation because of the COVID situation, but IPAL is not new. So they're very practiced at supporting you. The, the new piece is the K-5 Academy. Um, but even that, it, it's very similar to the work that they've done in the past. So they'll be able to help you out. With that. Okay, thank you. So I have to, I, I have to share this. So I was raised um, by my grandmother and I lived with her um, through my, into my high school and my college and then into my student teaching years. And I just have such extraordinary gratitude to my grandmother in helping me be the person that I am today and um, really achieve those goals that I had myself after high school and college. So I have a special place in my heart for grandparents who are raising um, their grandchildren. So I just wanted to express my gratitude to you on behalf of a 10 year old who doesn't know yet how special that really is. So I'm saying thank you to hit to you on his behalf. And one day I'm sure that he'll say thank you to you as well. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, Marie Lee says that they've been in practice since 2013 for IPAL. Yeah. Um, do you want to take another question? Sure. I'll hang out for uh, a little bit longer. Jennifer, you are unmuted. Hi, Jennifer. Right. Hi. Um, right. I'm good. Thank you. Um, so I have a question regarding online learning. Um, I 
I'm a staff member and a parent, and so I have tons of questions from all different angles, and I know that some of those questions are yet to be figured out, so I'm being patient, but I'm just wondering how long I have until I need to make a decision about whether my kids are going to do online learning. Like, I don't know if there's limited space or if it will be available for whoever wants it, if there's a deadline, that sort of thing. Oh man, that's a great question. I don't think we've gotten as so far to talk about deadlines and so on. I mean, I, I don't think it's fair of us to ask you to make a decision until you've seen the plan, which isn't until the end of um, July and won't be approved till mid-August, yeah. um, August 13th. So I think it's only fair that we give you some time, but it's a great question. And you know, the, the truth is, Jennifer, we wanna be fully flexible too. And you know, IPAL, they add students all the time. So um, I appreciate your patience and uh, just take a deep breath, we'll figure that out. But it's a great question and probably one we need to figure out sooner as opposed to later and mm -hmm. post it as a frequently asked question. Um, so we'll get with Deb Thurston and find out kind of what the deadline there would be. Okay. My Thank hunch you. with online learning though is Jennifer, they, can, they add kids all the time. So even if you decided later, yeah. you know, gave it a shot in the fall and it wasn't working and then transitioned, like I think you probably have a lot of options, um, but it's a great question in terms of a deadline and one we need an answer to. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to make sure because I have a friend in Richland who was looking into um, Homelink there and they apparently are full and have a waiting list and so I didn't know if we would have that same type of limitation. Yeah, no, it's a great question. I, that's why I love doing these forums because you guys think of the details that I hadn't thought about. Um, and I think it's a, a really a fair question of us as a district and Deb Thurston may have already given it some thought. We just need to get a question or a, an answer to that communicated out. Okay, and I have one other quick question if you don't mind. No, that's fine. Um, have there been discussions about if we did a rotational method, would all students be coming at some point during the week or would it be priority for students who have more of a need to be in person for learning? Yeah, that's a great question and, and one that so superintendents are grappling with across the state. I, I will tell you, again, there's focus groups that are gonna be meeting to, to inform these decisions. My personal stance is that every student should have the opportunity for in-person instruction every week. Now, some students may need more um, yeah, I'm thinking about some of our specialized special education programs. I think we need to think about those students differently. Um, but in terms of, you know, our typically developing students, every one of our typically developing students needs to come to school during the week um, on some kind of a rotational schedule. And then we need to look at those specialized needs to see how do we meet that or how do we meet those beyond. Um, that's my, my philosophy at this point. Um, Certainly the focus groups will dig into that and um, inform that decision, but I, I believe every student should get some in-person instruction every week. Um, and then, like I said, if you have, if students who have that really specialized needs, I'm thinking, you know, some of our medically fragile students and so forth may need more, um, but I don't think that would preclude all students from having some in-person education every week. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, you bet. It's good to hear your voice. <laughs> uh, okay um oh, you, amanda <laughs> people are saying nice things in the chat you're gonna make me cry <laughs> um breath weight or breath weight we you are unmuted hi yes my name's andrea Braithwaite, and okay. i i teach uh special ed preschool for the pasco school district and, hi, Andrea. Hi. <laughs> I, miss, I miss coming into your classroom. I miss my classroom. <laughs> but um, I just want to make sure that our little guys don't get forgotten and that their special needs um, in the sense of they have their ways and, and they're very strong in their opinions. And so just the whole social distancing and masks and facial coverings and sanitization and then the technology part can us teachers get maybe I don't know if we can get a specialized because I did try zooming and it, it was a little different 
<laughs> it was more just social saying hi or seeing everything in their in their um house but um I the baby brother yeah yeah <laughs> anything and everything but I I just know that we're little we're just a little group to the side but um oh. <laughs> no. but but just that we um because we're a little different than everybody else and and that's okay yeah. and and we're happy to be that but we just don't want to be forgotten well and i appreciate you emailed me really early on doing some advocating and i really appreciate that um christy dawkin actually has reached out and um i believe i'm looking at susan sparks i believe that we've identified a special focus group for pre-k and christy dawkin is going to facilitate that so that was a request from christy dawkin we're happy to accommodate that request, it's the right thing to do. And so you might reach out to Christy to find out um, kind of what her vision is for that, Andrea, but we absolutely, and, and please don't ever feel like you're a little group off to the side. You, the, <laughs> the littlest learners are the heart of, of the work that we do. And it's just such like, if you can't be happy at the pre-K center, I can't help you. Like that yeah. place is amazing. <laughs> we I just love, love it. it. Oh, yes. I, there's nothing better than coming there and sitting in those tiny chairs. Like it just, I, 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 can't, I can't, it's amazing. So anyways, there will be a focus group focused on pre-K. Reach out to Christy Dock and Andrea. And again, thank you for reaching out very early on in the closure and advocating for the early learning center. Um, we really appreciated your advocacy. It was the right thing to do. Well, thank you. And I was wondering, is there a way to, um, do more collaboration with the other districts because it's just us so we don't know any more than what we know and i've been doing a lot of those um webinars that are through the state and i get to meet with people that are teaching what i'm teaching and are facing issues and doing different things and i've just gained a whole lot of information so i figure if we're just with the people that are right next to us like we can actually you know be right there together Oh, I, I have no problem with with that. I think anytime you can steal other people's great work, do it. <laughs> so I do just, all the time. <laughs> yeah, I give them credit. I mean, I'll tell people like, "Hey, this was so and so's idea. I totally stole it." Um, so yeah, I'm all for that. It's just you know, I think working with Christy in that focus group to figure out the logistics of how to make that happen. But and you know, I think there are some silver linings to all of this. And I think our ability to collaborate via technology opens up a, a broader opportunity for engaging with different people from across the state. So, you know, there that's maybe a silver lining, maybe not a bright, bright silver lining, but <laughs> it's a silver no, lining. It was um, a and great we're, opportunity. I'm in full support of that, Andrea. Well, awesome. Well, I will get with Christy. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, I did promise my fellow panelists that we were going to end at 7.30 is now 7.52. So out of respect for them, we'll wrap up. But um, for any of you that are on the call that didn't get questions answered, please make sure they're in the chat. We will get them answered. Um, any of you who have individual needs that you need my support with, Jay Richardson with an SON at psd1.org will get you connected to the right folks. And uh, I just really appreciate everyone being on the call, I appreciate my my fellow panelists, uh, Board Member Lankin, Assistant Superintendent Sparks and Reyes, and a special thank you to um, Shane Edinger, who was our moderator in the back and did a great job for us. So thank you for making my first Zoom uh, town hall enjoyable for me, and I hope it was informative for you. And uh, I'm happy to be a resource and support um, moving forward. So. If you didn't get your question answered, make sure it gets in the chat and we'll get some frequently asked questions posted for you. So thank you everyone. Good night. <laughs>